Hi everyone. Can you see me and hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. Perfect. Um, so my name is Heather Depre, and I am the director of the Patient Focus Certification Program at Americans for Safe Access. We are a third-party compliance program aimed at helping cannabis businesses succeed in putting in place quality programs to ensure product safety for patients and consumers. On my panel today, I have Josh Krasny, Dr. Shwetha Call, and Antonio Frazier, and I'm going to give each of them a minute to introduce themselves. So Josh, if you would like to go first, go on ahead. Hi, thank you, Heather, and uh, thank you to Debbie and Steph and all of the ASA team. Um, I'm just really glad that you guys decided to continue with this event, even though you had to do it virtually. Um, but as Heather said, my name is Josh Krosny. I'm the president, CEO, and founder of Cannabis Science Conference, which is the world's largest scientific and medical cannabis event. I also am the president and founder of Jade Canna Inc., which is a 501c3 nonprofit devoted to the advancement of cannabis science. Um, I also am a contributing editor and columnist for Cannabis Science and Technology Magazine and serve on the board of directors, I'm sorry, on the advisory board of California-based CannaKids. Oh, I have to unmute myself first. <laughs> Next up, thank you, Josh. Next up, Dr. Shweetha Call. Hello, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Oh, great. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Shweta Kahl. Um, I have a PhD in chemistry, and I started off in the pharmaceutical industry, so that's how I kind of made my journey into cannabis. Um, I started one of the first cannabis labs in Orange County, and then um, uh, recently left that position, but I'm the vice president of the California Cannabis Industry Association, which is one of the largest trade groups. Um, I really work a lot on trying to bridge the gap between science and legislation and advocacy, which has been a kind of interesting journey. So hopefully happy to share some of my experience and thoughts um, on bridging some of those uh, gaps. Perfect. And thank you for being able to join us on such short notice. Um, if you know, we were supposed to have uh, Julie Armstrong here. She had a family emergency and was unable to attend. So Dr. Call has so kindly filled in her place under uh, very short notice. So thank you very much. Um, and Antonio, <laughs> Antonio, let me give you a second to introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. My name is Antonio Frazier. I am the VP of Operations here at Canisafe. Uh, we are a compliance QC testing laboratory based in California. Um, have worked with uh, Swetha from her time in the industry in California, as well as Kids. So kind of connected to everyone in the family. And of course, you Heather with uh, PFC. We are a PFC certified lab here and uh, yeah, in, in Los Angeles. So ready to talk on the system smart people. Thank you, everybody. Thanks everyone, and we are, we are gonna be doing a, a round table format discussion, so slightly different than the other two panels that happened. So we're gonna start with one of the first questions here, which is, what are the hottest topics in cannabis QC science and what research or researchers are you currently following? And uh, let's start off with Josh. Okay, yeah, so definitely um, I think the, the, the hottest topic in um, QC research, obviously, still to this day, which is one of the reasons I was encouraged to get in the industry, is the need for standardization. Um, so for those that don't really understand the whole process behind that, um, you know, most industries are, are standardized. You know, my background is um, from staffing and recruiting for the analytical science industry. So as I mentioned a minute ago, when I got involved in cannabis, that was one of the things that was very interesting to me when I realized that this was a medicine that people have been using, you know, legally in California as a medicine since the 90s but it was not actually required to be tested for quality control. And coming from the background that I did, I was very um, you know, alarmed and also um, shocked that that, that that was the case. And um, you know, that's really something that a lot of groups have been working on. You know, we've been part of some of the collaborative groups that are um, working on standardizing the, the, the testing industry. I'm sure Antonio can talk a lot about that as well and his work. 
Um, but, you know, we really think this needs to be standardized. You know, obviously one of the biggest problems with it not being standardized is you have a situation where, you know, if you send the same cannabis sample to five or six different laboratories, you're likely to get five or six different results. And, you know, for patients, that can be a very confusing time, especially if you um, come across a product that really works for you. And, you know, I, I kind of always rather refer to cannabinoid profiles rather than um, strains and the names of the strains, because, you know, if you're in the state of Maryland and you pick up a blue green strain and it actually helps with, you know, the condition you're trying to treat, but then you go all the way out to California or Colorado and you try to pick up, you know, just a generic blue dream stream anywhere else, that likely to be very, very different from, from what you've had in, in other states. So I think that's really one of the hottest um, topics right now. Obviously, um, you know, testing for quality control is so important for patient safety, um, not only for, you know, the obvious reason of, you know, contamination. Obviously, we don't want sick patients to be uh, consuming contaminated cannabis. I always say that cannabis inherently itself is, you know, one of the safest things on earth. Um, and no one has ever died as a direct overdose of cannabis, but that doesn't mean that we don't have things like contamination and drug interactions and other things to worry about. So obviously I think that's really important. I also think that, um, you know, accurate labeling and dispensing of the cannabinoids are really important because as I just said, it's more about a cannabinoid profile than it is a, you know, strain name. So really, um, you know, trying to target treat conditions and individuals, it's really important to be able to replicate um, those results. So, um, you know, one of my, you know, favorite researchers in the QCQA space is, is Dr. Jack Kenyon. He's someone I've been following for years and years and years. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of my two cents on what's going on with QCQA right now. Thanks, Josh. Um, Antonio, what about you? What are some topics that you're seeing that are currently at the forefront of QC science as a laboratory operator? And uh, what research and researchers are you currently following? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I do agree with everything Josh said. I will say, um, as an operating lab, we obviously are pretty fond of our methods, so uh, we're not necessarily looking for, for other ones, but it is certainly a problem. Um, beyond that, though, I think some of the next steps are some of the things that we did uh, last year, not only just vapor testing, you know, to not, to, not just profile these oils, but to see what we're actually consuming, but as well as of shelf life. You know, we've got a lot of smart operators who are coming in from spaces like food and pharmaceutical who are now demanding that more information be available to protect the patient. Like how long is my vape cart good? If it, if it gets too hot in my car, if it, you know, if it faces some mechanical stress like being dropped, uh, if, if my cannabis food products aren't being stored properly, how good are they until they become a threat to the patient? I think that's what's next. And the overall chase we're all trying to figure out is how these cannabinoids, um, end up affecting the patient. I think QC is a big part of that because without profiling, you have no idea what uh, you're administering to someone during a trial. So I think that all uh, the profiling is going to be the start, kind of how we build this pyramid to legitimize cannabis science. As far as particular researchers, um, scientifically, I mean, I, I, I'm not really a scientist. I'm, a, I'm an operations person. Uh, but overall, I will say Dr. Meacham is always a classic. And currently, I can't think of anyone that I'm following personally. No, I'm just all about kind of the political landscape and kind of the efficiency and just um, culture of the whole deal. So I don't really have anyone I can speak on. I know that's pretty bad on the science panel, but y'all gotta forgive me. <laughs> uh, we will forgive you for that just because we know you do have a small baby at home. So your time has been preoccupied. <laughs> um, Shweetha, what about you? What are um, some current topics in uh, QC chemistry that you're looking at and any research or researchers that you are following? I think standardization is the name of the game right now. So I think there's a lot of um, activity and work that's being done on standardization. But just to bring some perspective, um, you know, the same kind of thing has happened in the food industry, in the EPA industry, when regulations hit and then everyone had to adapt to it. It took a while for standardization to happen. In that, those industries, it took, you know, a few decades for that to happen. I don't think the industry, cannabis industry quite has the patience for that, and I think we're going to see that accelerated and happen in a lot faster manner than you are seeing happen um, in some of those industries. What I am interested in right now is there's uh, this emergence of creating a standard. And by standard, I mean not necessarily uh, the methodology. The analytical methodology is going to take a while to get uh, consensus methods that arise from the industry because that also comes from um, a little bit more openness and transparency, and that takes a little while for the industry to get there. But a standard in the sense of what are the requirements 
for quality systems, right? So very similar to kind of, uh, it sounds like the work that you're doing where you're managing the quality system. So for a lab to meet certain requirements, they might use different instrumentation, different techniques, but they still have to have some minimum requirements. And I think we're starting to see that emergence of some kind of minimum standards that are beyond ISO 17025 and that are beyond what the state regulations are. The other thing that I'm really interested in right now is um, there is a lot of talk about personalized medicine because as we get more and more into cannabinoid profiling and understanding the interplay between terpenes and cannabinoid analysis, you are now trying to see and correlate that with patient effects. And I think we're going to get to a point where, especially with a lot of the tissue culture work that's being done right now and people actually making personalized strains, now you can connect that between certain outcomes and certain strain profiles. So I think that's really cool and interesting. Um, I think the dosage studies are important, but I am really interested in low dose analysis. So that means we're you, looking at different kind of instrumentation. So as an analytical chemist, this is always close to my heart. Uh, I think there are ways that we have all this instrumentation in labs, but people aren't maximizing it, right? Mass specs are very powerful instruments, but you can actually maximize that to look at low dose analysis. You can maximize that to look at unknown analysis, right? Right now we're looking at contaminants that the state has a list of. That's probably gonna change over time as we understand the plant more and understand how it impacts patients and uh, figure out which ones have negative impact, which ones are not really commonly found. So that list is gonna adapt and change, but that can only happen when you start having unknown analysis. Now, as far as researchers and scientists, a lot of the researchers and scientists that I follow are generally on the clinical side of things, right? So it's like the Tel Aviv University and you know a lot of the researchers that are working on things like that. Unfortunately, on the analytical chemistry side of things, a lot of the, this research is actually coming from the vendors. You know, sadly, they're the ones that are able to put information out there without many restrictions. So you're seeing, you know, Agilent and Sciex and Perkin Elmer and Thermo Fisher and a lot of their teams have some great scientists and they're actually able to put out unknown analysis. They're able to put out analytical chemistry methods that necessarily the labs are not able to put out. I think that's going to change over time and I'm looking forward to that. I think you're going to start seeing labs start to publish some more. And, you know, there are a lot of really good analytical chemists and PhDs and scientists within the lab industry right now that are a little bit, um, you know, uh, held back by the industry's uh, propensity for not sharing information. And I think that's going to start changing. I think you're going to start seeing some publications start to come out from within the industry. And that will actually lead to what Josh is uh, alluded to, which is the standardization and consensus methodology arising from within. Fantastic. I love that every single one of you talked about standardization and we have a couple questions regarding standardization a little further on. So that is very exciting. Um, while we're on the topic of current research, um, are there any researchers doing anything right now where you feel like they might be close to publishing something that's going to have an impact on patient lives? And as you mentioned, um, Shweta, the personalized medicine, um, you know, that's one of those things that we're starting to see more patients getting access to as we get more access to test results and standardization. So in addition to personalized medicine, or if you want to talk a little bit more about personalized medicine, um, what do you think is going to be impacting patients as far as research goes um, that you might see coming up soon on the horizon? Um, and I'll let you start with that one, uh, Shweta. Okay, so one thing that I'm super excited about right now is there are there's a lot of really cool studies looking at minor cannabinoids and minor terpenes, and I think that's going to have an immediate impact. I think, uh, you know, there was recently a discovery of uh, a minor cannabinoid called THCP, and THCP is supposed to have even better binding affinity to CB2 receptors. So this just means that they found, it's very preliminary, but essentially you found a molecule that binds to a CB2 receptor more strongly than the THC molecule. And so in theory, you have an idea that maybe that has a greater efficacy, 
but there's still studies that need to happen out of that. But this just tells us that, you know, something that all of us know instinctively, which is the plant is a lot more complicated than one or two active ingredients, and that there's an interplay happening there. And, you know, we call it, you know, the, they, they say the entourage effect, and everyone keeps talking about that, and there's scientists that kind of stay away from it. And I, I understand, but there are definitely multiple mechanisms happening simultaneously, and I think we're starting to uncover some of that interplay, you know, they, it looks like there are terpenes that have um, impacts that on uh, pharmacology that people didn't, imp in, didn't anticipate, and then there's also um, cannabinoids that might impact, um, you know, the uh, overall effect and the taste and smell of things that, again, people didn't uh, expect either. So I think all of that research on minor cannabinoids is going to open up a whole new world of possibilities, especially with, as we understand, dosing a little bit more, right? And microdosing is seeming to have a lot of really positive impacts and positive outcomes for people. And I, and I have a feeling, and this is purely instinctive because we still have need data to back this up, but I think it's because of a lot of the minor cannabinoids that you're seeing some of those effects. Because if you look at the pharmacology of the major cannabinoids, they shouldn't have an impact at those dosage levels. There's just no way. So there's something else happening and we're starting to uncover some of those, um, those things. Fantastic. I am learning a lot today. So uh, Antonio, why don't you uh, go ahead next? Um, what's some current research that you think is gonna have uh, impact on patients? Yeah, thank you. So um, I'll back it up again to the process view because Swipe is killing it with some of this clinical, so there's no need for me to uh, re repeat it. But what I think is next for the patients, like everyone's saying, terpenes, minor cannabinoids, things that are so important. Like uh, in California, terpenes are only required if they're labeled. But the reality of it is we should be talking terps when people go into, uh, you know, for some kind of consultation. It should be one of the forefronts of the conversation. So with that, we're seeing as a QC, as a profile lab, just better processes for manufacturing to create more consistent products in general. I mean, a lot of people don't, everyone has their own kind of secret sauce, not only in the lab, but also in the manufacturing world and cultivation world. And I come from aerospace and nuclear engineering and manufacturing. And what people don't realize is that at some point, they're going to tell you how to build it, not only how to test for it. So what's neat is seeing the, um, especially in California, producers and people, uh, to Swayta's point, find new products and new ways to target and to advertise and then to profile and identify and label it for clients to understand better. So what I think the next thing is just information, like uh, groups like ASA and uh, ourselves and CSA, all these different groups out there, Kennedy is also just educating people, letting them understand these things that we're talking about. Because it's really, I hate to say, I mean, butt tenders really influence. I see some of like 70% of decisions uh, in, in, in a dispensary. And they're just, quite frankly, unqualified a lot of the time to have that conversation. There are some great people out there doing things to bring that into their stores. But it's just not it's not standardized enough. I mean, I mean, we talk about standardization, all facets of it, that there's some great leaders out there getting ahead of it, trying to help the patient, but until it's required, until there's federal support, until it's mandated, until there's oversight, we're not going to be really, we're not going to be a real industry in the sense of what we're used to seeing things because there's not all those things in place to ensure that things are consistent, clear, and in the best interest of patients. But we're getting there, though. We certainly are getting there. Thanks, Antonio. Uh, and Josh, same to you. Um, what do you what do you see helping patients in the future in terms of uh, new research? Yeah, so I definitely agree with everything that uh, Suitha and Antonio just said. I think we're really starting to see um, patients over the past couple of years have really started to get more passionate about educating themselves um, and learning, you know, the why behind the the what, if you will. And I think that's really important. I always say that you know, empowered patients make the best patients because, as Antonio said, you know. Um, you know, bud tenders are such an important job and they are kind of the, you know, the conduit between the patient and their medicine. And there's not a lot of, um, you know, businesses that are putting in the, you know, the funding to provide education for, for their bud tenders. But really, you know, these people are basically, you know, at the end of the day, basically like pharmacists. So, you know, you, if you thought about the, that kind of the other way around and you thought about walking to a pharmacy and talking to someone there and they really didn't have the education. So we're starting to see more education with, like I said, the bud tenders, the patients, I think that's great. And I think with that, 
we're starting to see people opening up. We were kind of in this, um, this wind tunnel of everybody wanted like the highest THC, even medical patients that were using it. And I don't know how that, you know, became the big thing. And, you know, that's one of the issues we see with testing. Um, you know, we, we, we have a lot of people that'll do, um, you know, lab results shopping. So really, obviously, it's still really popular to have high THC products. So, you know, different processes can give you a different result, um, whether it be THC, CBD, whatever. So a lot of people are going to four or five different laboratories and they're using the one laboratory that gives them the highest THC marker. But we're starting to see patients that are getting a little bit more um, knowledgeable about this topic and not really falling for it's just the highest THC because we're seeing that different conditions obviously call for different cannabinoid profiles. And kind of how um, Suitha was saying earlier, you know, there's so many different compounds and so many different cannabinoid profiles, if you will, really the, 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 the limits are endless uh, just about. And each one of these different profiles is technically another medicine. Um, and really going back to what Suitha was also saying about personalized medicine, I think it's fantastic to see the cannabis industry is embracing this and that's becoming more of a thing because I feel like in traditional healthcare, you know, we were seeing that, but just around the same time when, you know, cannabis was prohibited so that we can monopolize, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical and paper industry, I think personalized medicine was also kind of pushed to the wayside because it was more profitable, obviously, to have that one size fits all pill and to monopolize um, that market. So I really think that, you know, going back to what she was talking about with the THCP. I actually did a great interview with Dr. Um, Giuseppe Cananza, who actually was one of the researchers that discovered um, the new cannabinoid. And for anyone that's interested in checking that out, um, I, like I said in the beginning, I, I write a column every, um, every issue for Cannabis Science and Technology Magazine. So you, on their website, they have all of our columns there. Um, that was just, I think, the... Uh, February issue. So that's up there now. I also have um, the last one from this past month from March that was um, interviewing with two different um, leaders from different um, academic universities that are doing cannabis programs. So I think, you know, we're just seeing a lot happening. Um, and I think that patients really are starting to get more and more interested about taking, you know, charge of their own health care and their own, um, you know, treatment with cannabis. And, you know, I know that we've seen over the years a really big uptick in patients coming um, out to our conferences and attending our medical tracks and our hemp tracks. So we're really just excited to see, you know, imp patients embracing that and, and not just being, you know, do this, do that, but really knowing, understanding the why behind the what. Fantastic. Um, really enjoying this discussion so far. Um, and sort of one of the last questions on the research topic, um, just overall in general, um, are there any new technologies? Um, in addition to the personalized medicine, what are some new technologies um, that we're seeing come out that are really going to help patients either with tracking their medicine or determining what's going to be effective for them um, or even just new delivery methods for their medicine? What are some things uh, that you guys are seeing that uh, are going to help patients out there in terms of technology? Uh, let's start with Antonio on this one. Yeah, so that's actually a great question. There are things like uh, QR codes and labeling that a lot of uh, companies are doing now to give more education about what is in their product and what it means. And then beyond that, we're seeing these journals where they become handouts or people are having these apps that they're logging on to. People are uh, documenting their experience and then able to also crowdsource. So there's other people it took the same product that are coming on as well. And people are trying to conglomerate this data to start uh, making some of these determinations that we're talking about. So that's one of the things that I've seen that that, that community, back to education again, honestly, it's just about better resources for education, uh, not only from the brands who of course are gonna tell you everything is perfect, uh, not just from the labs who are gonna tell you what's in it, but then from you know your peers and other people just like you that are curious and passionate, there's just new avenues to communicate and new community aspects. Um, as far as lab technology, I can't really uh, think of anything right now that's new or groundbreaking. Obviously, we're always pushing, like Swetha said, uh, to, 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 to figure out the unknown. I mean, less, I mean, potency is anywhere between, you know, 10 to, I actually came out, we've seen a lot of 30 percenters. Now people are now cultivating for THC, unfortunately. Uh, you know, so, so, so we've seen things go from, you know, all the purples and whatnot that aren't supposed to be over 20 to begin with. Now we're seeing them at these lap shops. But uh, beyond that, I guess my, my, my point about new, Things, oh my god, I just completely about went on a lab shopping tangent. I'm so sorry, I just completely lost my I lost my turn. I thought I, I got excited about lab shopping, but what I wanted to say about products was oh, we don't know what's in the flower. I mean, we got maybe 30% THC, 
a few points of terpenes, what's the rest of it? What's that other 60%? And that's what we don't know and people don't realize that. That's why flour is going to have a hard time being standardized or, uh, or anything. Because like Josh said, every single profile is a different medicine technically. We used to look at things at, at, a, singular, at a, single a single molecule level for the FDA and until we either change how we view medicine or we really start, you know, isolating and identifying these ratios, we're really going to, there's going to be a gap between traditional uh, medicine and health practitioners and what cannabis is doing. So that's what I believe we're all alluding to is that um, all these new innovations are trying to bridge that gap so our practitioners can start prescribing things and pharmacists, which are our buttons, can become more educated or you put a better system in place for patients. So, um, so nothing, I guess I'll say is groundbreaking, but I know we're working on all these things. It's kind of my point, I, I think in processes. So just patients can be aware that the industry is, are doing things to, to supplement the lack of federal support. There's no other way to put it. I mean, this stuff comes with so much money and research, research from schools and feds and whatnot. And every, every other industry gets that, but us. And we're all of a sudden, you know, demonized and supposed to do it ourselves and pay for it ourselves. And it's like, I would love to, run a 30 minute method on every sample I get to know what's in it, but I'm not gonna make any money. My lab isn't gonna be there for very long if I'm doing that, I'm making that investment on my, on my own. So that's kind of the conundrum we're in. We spent a lot of money last year on our, on our vape study and we think it was worth it because everyone seemed to respond well, but you never really know. There's always a role, there's always a shot in the dark when you do things that aren't your expertise. And our expertise right now is, is uh, profiling and being a high throughput lab. Thanks, Antonio. Um, Shvizo, what about you? What are some uh, emerging technologies uh, that you think patients should be aware of? So right now um, in the science, so cannabis is a very interesting space compared to everyone else, right? In most other traditional um, industries, you start off with R&D, you figure out how, why it works, how it works, and then you commercialize and then it goes to use. Right now in cannabis, we're already using it, we know it's efficacious, and now we're trying to figure out why it's efficacious. So we kind of have to start thinking a little differently. If you look at uh, traditional um, analytical tools that we use for diagnosing and testing, they're, we're, we're seeing advances in, in them, but they're not groundbreaking. You know, it's the same technology, but used in different applications. The groundbreaking stuff that we're gonna see right now is actually the emergence of um, data mining and big data analytics. So we're actually seeing a lot of technology uh, in the sense of not instrumentation, scientific instrumentation, but actually crunching all this data because now we have data on what's in the medicine, what are the patient outcomes, what is efficacious in what conditions, and now we actually need some way of bridging all of that together. So a lot of technology companies are jumping in and you're seeing a lot of like AI-based you know, smart thinking, machine learning, to try and predict, okay, if you had this outcome and this particular strain worked for you, what else can work for you that is along the same lines and have the same kind of um, combination and same kind of profiles? I think that we are gonna see an emergence of something like that, but the problem is you need a lot more sharing of information. Um, so either, this will, this will come at the point where we have more consolidation in the industry, which is gonna happen, um, and also when you have access to data, but we're starting to see an emergence of this. There's a lot of really cool tech, tech companies that are coming up that are using, you know, point of sale systems and correlating it with patient outcomes. And now we need to connect it with the back end, which is with the labs. So if you can bridge that data gap from start to finish, you're now actually going to have a lot of really cool data to crunch where now you can actually start predicting, okay, you know what, you took this strain and you found at this dose and you found this effect, how about trying this one? I think this could be, um, have some efficacy in whatever your condition is. And I think that's super interesting. Um, as far as application-based stuff of things that are already existing, I'm really excited to see um, us bring some of the existing technologies from other industries. So like the CDC has been doing vapor studies on tobacco forever. And we need to do a lot more of that in cannabis so that we can actually get an accurate uh, dosage of what you're actually dosing yourself. Right now, we don't have that, um, you know, specifically. We also don't know what's being transferred in the smoke. You know, some of the contaminants that we think of as harmful might be harmless because they don't get transferred in smoke. And some of the less toxic things might get converted, uh, you know, in, in the process of pyrolysis and when you are smoking it to something that's a lot more 
dangerous. So I think the vapor study aspect of it, I think is super interesting. And I know Antonia's lab has been doing some of the work in that. And I think we're going to see a lot more expansion along that. But to me, the really cool stuff is all of the data. The big data analytics is really going to be the future of uh, this industry. Thank you. Uh, yeah, data analytics, uh, definitely huge. And I'm sure Antonio deals with a lot of data on a daily basis. Um, Josh, what about you? What are some technologies uh, that you see coming out that may be beneficial or improved upon from old technologies that may help patients? Yeah, so I mean, as far as like analytical instrumentation, like I really, I think it's important to say like, you know, and not just with this, but many aspects of this industry as a whole, is we're not reinventing the wheel here. And I think a lot of times we feel the need to try to reinvent the wheel. So these technologies have been used, you know, HPLC has been used in so many different industries for, for so many, so many different years. So I think really just um, building the education around that. I know, um, you know, we're seeing vendors like one of our, uh, our biggest partners, Shimatsu Scientific Instruments, they've done a um, cannabis analyzer for potency that really kind of mainstreams it and makes it a little more easier and simpler to use. Um, so you don't have to be that, you know, super, super trained um, analytical professional to be able to actually um, operate the machinery. You know, we are starting to see um, some of these more, I would call them like at home potency testing, or kind of maybe if you're a cultivator, you kind of want to have your own, um, you know, stuff uh, kind of while you're cultivating and harvesting. Um, again, I don't think that those are as sensitive as an HPLC or something uh, more analytical. I think we're still seeing more and more information on stuff like that coming out. But I think that, um, you know, at the end of the day, we have, we have this equipment, it works great. And I think that just figuring out how to do it. And again, doubling back to the standardization point, it's, it's, just, it's really important that everyone's using the same rule book. And I know that, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, when I say the same rule book, I mean the same kind of methods and standards and, and using the same type of instrumentation, because um, really any of these things that you change can affect the, um, the end results of, of, your, of your test. So I really feel that getting it standardized, and I know it's, it's, it's a little challenging because, um, you know, lab testing market in cannabis is a competitive market and um you know i've been to laboratories and you know they're like oh well we can't let you back here because this is our you know proprietary information and then they let you back there and it's like a nutri blender that they're using for sample prep so it's a lot that's, that's happening but again I, I i kind of really feel that um when it comes to the analytical um side of things i really feel that not reinventing the wheel and utilizing the technologies that we've had and improving on them it's really uh key Thanks, Josh. Um, so one of the biggest challenges we have here in the US is our Schedule I status for cannabis. Um, but compared to researchers in other countries, what are some of the other challenges that you see US researchers facing? And do you feel with the implementation of the Agricultural Improvement Act that we are starting to get on the right path towards um, opening more doors for research? Um, and I'll start with Shweta on this one. I mean, the short answer is just no. I mean, <laughs> we're so far behind research, it's not even funny. I mean, you know, I, um, as an immigrant myself, I'll tell you, I came to the U.S. because I was always excited about how uh, much money and time was invested in science in R&D and scientific research. And that always excited me. And that was one of the main reasons I even came to um, to get educated here and to learn about research and, you know, do a lot of uh, really cool things on the scientific end. And it's very disappointing um, how shackled cannabis researchers have been over here. There's a lot of access. Most research in, um, most R&D that happens in the U.S. is based off of federal grants. That's just the truth of it. Most come, the best of our science, scientific research is not from the private industry. It actually is driven by the public uh, sector and it's driven by universities. And universities do their research based on access to grant funding and they have absolutely no access to grant funding and they're very dependent on state level funding or private grants. And so we're kind of turning the system on its head right now. And there are a lot of really cool um, scientists that are doing want to do a lot more research. They want to do a lot more and they just are not able to. And, you know, we're kind of losing ground right now. There's a lot of really interesting research that's coming out of, you know, everyone knows about Israel being at the front, forefront of things. But right now, even South America is starting to do a lot more research. And we're seeing really cool, uh, you know, interesting studies that are coming out of, you know, Colombia and coming out of Brazil. I mean, there's 
everyone is starting to invest money in this because they see this as something that has a lot of applications across a lot of different um, a lot of di different issues and pa patient pain points that can really be efficacious and we're just ignoring it and we're kind of losing track right now. I think one of the interesting uh, tactics that I've heard researchers use is that, you know, there are already a lot of users out there and you have enough people using specific strains and specific dosages and so, you know, it's almost like outsourcing clinical trials in a way, right? Like using the users that's out there and using uh, data from patients and trying to like compile it. So I know some people are trying to circumvent the system and do that, but the truth is until you get federal funding behind this, there's no way private funding can even compare to the level of federal funding that's required. I mean, I come from the pharmaceutical industry. It, it costs $20 billion to launch one drug. That's the research that goes into it. It's from start to finish. It's a really large amount, you know, and when people talk about, oh, we're going to invest 20, 30 million in research, it sounds like a lot, but I can tell you from a lab perspective, that can go really quickly. You're talking one clinical trial, right? I mean, so it, it's one of those things that um, it's really cool to see people trying to circumvent the system and try and figure out ways in which they can work around it, but think how much more we can do once we have that. So there's a part of me that doesn't want descheduling to happen because I understand then that opens up um, a lot of traditional corporations to jump in and kind of take over from um, the sort of grassroots movement and the sort of understanding that's already built within our industry. But we do need some, some level of descheduling to happen in order to get access to funding. Um, I think the FDA is starting to recognize it. And so, you know, you've seen the FDA put out um, a lot of guidances on uh, the uh, on ways that they're, they're okaying approval processes for drugs that are based on cannabis. But if you read about this, this is not coming from a place of understanding, right? They're, they're approving Epidiolex, which is one active ingredient. And then you're ignoring things that are actually looking at multiple ingredients. And that's what patients are seeing that they have e uh, efficacy for is when you have uh, the whole plant or you're having um, terpene effects and things like that. I mean, we're already starting to see, you know, cannabis hyperemesis come in because people are so focused on THC and, you know, only high potency strains. So, yeah, I mean, the short answer is like no, but the long answer is uh, there is a lot of hope. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of optimism as well. <laughs> um, just as a, a follow up to the question, um, do you feel like cross-border collaborations are going to be able to happen? more or do you feel like there has been an increased amount of information sharing between researchers in different countries or do you think that because of where we are at in the US we're still not able to have as much free collaboration as we would be if if we, it was more permissive yeah I mean there's definitely there, there's definitely scientists will find a way to do good research right and what I'm seeing is a lot of scientists uh, will help out with other studies whether it is uh, reviewing the data, crunching the data, writing the papers for them. So they, you are starting to see some of that collaboration start to emerge where, you know, people realize that the expertise is here. And so how do we get that expertise out and collaborate with some of these other universities that are, that are able to do these studies? So scientists will find a way to make that happen, but we're not making it easier. Thank you. Um, and Josh, same to you. Um, what are your thoughts on on international collaboration and the status of our research of opportunities in the U.S. Yeah, so I think that obviously, you know, we have a huge problem in the U.S. because of the Schedule One, um, you know, status of cannabis. And I always, you know, whenever I'm in a group of people, and you know, if I'm out to dinner with people that aren't part of the industry, I, I'm always talking about cannabis, which I'm sure most of you uh, do as well. But I always say to people, whether or not you you are behind this, or you are 100% like this should be medical or this should be recreational, whatever your stance is, I don't think that anyone in their right mind can sit here and say that they actually agree that cannabis belongs as a Schedule One drug alongside heroin. So I think even the people, like I said, that are not completely on board with this also can be 
intellectually honest with themselves and say that it would not belong where it is. Um, that being said, there's only one source of cannabis for research in the US. Um, if you do go after that coveted, you know, schedule one research license, um, and I'm sure as many of the viewers are familiar with Dr. Sue Sisley, who's one of my dear friends and colleagues that I've been very blessed to be connected with in this industry. Um, and she went through all the, you know, the hassle and the, you know, the, the hoops and the whistles and the red tape to obtain a schedule one um, research license. But the only um, cannabis that's, you know, coming for research is coming from the University of Mississippi, which is being cultivated with standards set forward by um, the National Institute of Drug Abuse. So whenever I tell people that, I'm like, it's really interesting because the National Institute of Drug Abuse's primary role is to study the potential negative um, and harmful effects of drugs, not the potential therapeutic effects. So, you know, that being said, um, they're really using outdated and archaic standards for cultivation. Um, if you've ever heard the joke that it's, you know, it's not your parents' weed anymore, it's kind of like that's what you're getting from, from the University of Mississippi. It is, you know, not the kind of cannabis that has been cultivated and really, you know, fine-tuned and, and turned into what it is today, what we would, you know, find in a dispensary really in any, you know, any typical market. So I think that's the biggest challenge. And I know that was Sue's biggest challenge was to go through all that work to get this research license. And it really ends up being, you're trying to do the apples to oranges thing. You know, you're trying to get that results from studying apples, but you have to use oranges uh, for your research. So that really can be challenging, um, you know, at the end of the day. So um, I really think it's interesting for those of you who aren't familiar with Dr. Sue, definitely give her a Google, check her out. She just um, successfully did sue the DEA for the federal monopoly on cannabis for research. Um, you know, she won in that case, but, you know, winning against the government, I'm sure is still a very long process and it's not going to be tomorrow that the light switch turns on, but hopefully, you know, we're making progress in the right direction. Um, I do feel that the cross-border collaborations are so important. Um, like Swetha said before, obviously Israel has been leading the way uh, for decades and decades and decades in this. Um, Dr. Deddy Miri from the Technion Institute is a good friend of mine. Um, I know that Tracy Ryan and Canna Kids, we have been collaborating with him uh, for a few years um, on research with cancer and cannabis. Um, and I think that, you know, it's really interesting when you look at the U.S., um, given our drug policy laws here and how, you know, it's state by state by state by state by state, it's almost like we're living in separate little countries when it comes to the drug policies. And I always say that, you know, a patient or an individual who's using this and it's helping them, their condition doesn't, doesn't change if they have one foot in one state and one foot in the other state. So I think it's really difficult to, um, you know, look at it that way. It's obviously difficult because researchers cannot ship samples across state lines. There are different regulations and different requirements in each state. So I think it's, it's very difficult and we're seeing countries like obviously Israel, um, you know, Colombia has legalized it completely for medical in the entire country. Um, even Australia, the complete entire country is legalized for medical. Um, Canada is completely legal now across the board. So obviously when you have that scenario, it's much um, easier to, to get in and do the research. But I think that, you know, it's, it is important to, to foster these cross-border collaborations until we get there. And I always, I always think it's interesting that, you know, in the United States, when it serves us, we rely on our ally countries. But for things like this, you know, Israel is supposed to be a great ally of ours. Why can't we rely on them for some of their research when it comes to this topic? So it really, you know, at the end of the day, this is all about stigma and prohibition and, and reefer madness, if you will. We're trying to dig out of 50 plus years of mis misinformation um, that people have been spoon fed. And I always kind of tell people when I have that initial conversation about cannabis is, you know, this has been used and accepted in society as a medicine and a commodity for far, far longer than it has been prohibited as one. You know, this goes back to ancient China, ancient Greece, ancient Indian medicine. So it's not anything new, you know what I mean? It, what's, what's new is us having to dig out of this 50 plus years of prohibition. So I think we're, I think we're getting there. I think I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that this conversation is not completely based in medicine, but it is very political when it comes to the way that our, um, our laws are based federally here. And I think, I think one of the reasons that might throw off the government and the, and the regulators that are looking at this federally is the fact that it is something that is so safe and effective as a medicine, but it also is something that's a much safer alternative to using a rats of recreational product as opposed to alcohol or other illicit drugs. So I think they're kind of in this thing where they're confused 
confused on where to put this. And I know Steph touched on this um, early this morning when she opened the session on the differences. And, you know, I know I'm getting a little bit off topic here, but I agree with, you know, ASA stance that, you know, we, we really need to protect medical patients and that we need to legalize this as a medical program. That being said, I'm not against a recreational program. I'm actually completely for adult use, but I think that those two programs will have to live side by side federally. And at least that's what I hope. And I really feel that, you know, once we get this going, um, it'll open up more research. But again, if this is, you know, legalized as a recreational product, there might not be as much um, interest and desire from the scientific community to get involved and, and do this research. Thanks, Josh. Um, Antonio, same to you. Um, international research, how is that uh, affecting you and how does that create challenges? Um, I'll keep it brief because everyone touched on it. It's essentially the lack of access to products. If you can't move THC even across state lines, how can I correlate with lab in a different state? How can we make sure the results will look the same? Uh, we get CBD from all over the world actually here at Canada Safe. So it's interesting, you know, seeing the different products and seeing different solvents being used. I mean, California has a big list, but it doesn't mean it's the only list, you know? So there's a lot of issues and gaps created that we're so far behind on. And just another outlook and uh that i'll hit on so we can keep moving is that uh when you realize that marijuana arrests are pretty much what funds the war on drugs it is the highest proportion it is uh the biggest money maker for our federal government you kind of realize why they're not moving their feet i mean if marijuana was dangerous they would have regulated it a long time ago it would already have research it would already uh you know have everything you want to know about it but it's not dangerous so there's been no movement not, nothing forcing our government to do anything besides the politics and unfortunately making money off of a disproportionate part of our community. Thanks, Antonio. Um, we have, uh, we're gonna work through one more set of questions that we've got and then we'll move on to uh, attendee questions. And so uh, we touched on the farm bill just a little bit earlier, but um, how does hemp search, hemp research vary from cannabis research and are the barriers uh, different for you now? Um, and let's start uh, with you, Josh. Yeah, so I think that, you know, obviously with, with the farm bill that has essentially, um, you know, obviously technically legalized um, CBD and hemp products. Um, you know, I, I think it's really interesting because, you know, we kind of were all this one community kind of fighting for the same thing um, for, for all these years. But then when that happened, we've kind of started to see a divide in the industry where CBD and hemp are starting to go on their own kind of um, industry, kind of separating from the cannabis industry. And we're starting to see, you know, hemp and CBD brands are not really, um, you know, wanting to associate with, with cannabis conferences or cannabis brands or things like that. They're wanting to get more involved with, you know, health and wellness shows and beauty expos and things like that. So in, in that sense, I feel that, um, you know, CBD and hemp, it is cannabis. We're talking about, you know, it's, it, we're talking about the same, you know, thing at the end of the day. So like, I don't know that I'm a big fan of kind of this industry separating, but I get it from a business standpoint, you know, that is kind of a, you know, not a loophole, but a way that you can um, do those CBD and hemp specific products, um, you know, legally. And I know that there have been, um, you know, quite some issues with that. I know that um, there have been some warning letters sent out by the FDA about um, hemp and, and CBD brands that are making erroneous medical claims. Um, you know, that's nothing new. We've, we've been seeing things like that um, in the industry for years and years and years. I, I've, you know, remember being at, you know, conferences and seeing, you know, hemp brands and, you know, they're, they're saying, oh, come use our product and, you know, you're, it'll cure your child's cancer, you know, and, and things like that. I think that, um, you know, for me, and I'm sure as probably the other panel here today. I, um, when talking about hemp or cannabis, I don't use the word cure or heal because we don't have that, that data to, to point to that. Um, I know it's definitely helping a lot of people, but I think, you know, for me, um, I spend half my time with, you know, the cannabis industry, but then the other half of my time with the, you know, traditional analytical science and medical industry. And you really have to, um, you know, be intellectually honest in, in, your, in your claims and what you're saying when you are part of that community. And our primary goal and what we do is to bridge the gaps between, um, you know, the cannabis community and traditional science and medicine. Um, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of, you know, people that are, are starting to get into the hemp research. Obviously, it's a lot easier because you don't have to, to go through all the schedule one, um, you know, to obtain that license. And just to put into context for any of the, uh, the viewers that don't really know or understand the way that the scheduling works is, you know, schedule one is the most harmful, most dangerous, um, no potential for medicinal value that you could use. And cannabis is it's scheduled there and it's scheduled next to heroin. 
Um, and, you know, cocaine is a Schedule II drug, which is basically kind of sending the message that cocaine is a little bit better for you than, than cannabis, which I don't know that anyone that, that would agree with that. So, you know, I think we're starting to see more and more uh, with the hemp research, and we're going to see more and more and more. Um, so I'm excited to see where that goes. But again, I, I truly feel that we're talking about the same, you know, plant at the end of the day and really um, dividing it too much. I, I, I worry about that. Thanks, Josh. And a, a slightly different variation for you, Antonio, as a lab operator, you know, the USDA delayed the requirement for uh, laboratories testing hemp to get a DEA Schedule 1 license. Um, how do you think that that delay is going to affect the testing of these hemp products this year and next year? And how is that going to have an impact on cannabis product testing? Okay, well, I think, um, make sure I understood the question. Uh, well, as far as the DA requirement to test hemp, uh, I'm glad that was delayed because how the DA licensed uh, labs aren't prepared to actually test hemp accurately because of the matrix differences. To Josh's point, it is the same plant. Um, that's why we think all the, well, we know all the problems persist. All the contaminants that are available uh, in cannabis are available in CBD products. Uh, just for the consumer, I'm terrified because the products are much more dangerous. They're actually much more full of solvents and pesticides. They're either really inaccurately labeled. I mean, you can sell a bottle of water for a dollar, put CBD on it, it's seven bucks, and half the time it has nothing in it, you know? And um, there's a really, there's a threat to me to the movement of cannabis. All the hard work that uh, we have done to educate and destigmatize and fight against uh, all these regulations, you're gonna have people producing hemp products with no requirements, no testing, uh, no oversight. And when they do fail in labs like ours, there's no one to stop them from selling it. That's the big difference. If you fell in compliance cannabis, someone's gonna make sure that batch is destroyed. You fell a CBD product, it's going to the store. And the store is probably a Whole Foods. It's probably a, a Walmart or a CVS where you think you're gonna trust the product. In reality, if it is, um, it's much, much more dangerous. And that's also something we noticed with our vape study. The CBD vapes were pretty much all flavor. And we talked about terpenes earlier. Yeah, terpenes are available at maybe four to five percent at your juiciest ones. But when you jack up flavor to be 99 percent of it, you're just smoking solvents and solvents are cleaning utensils. They're dangerous. They're carcinogenic. I mean, they're sorry, they're car carcinogenic. So there's just all these different things that the hemp industry is kind of getting away with that really scares me for a consumer business. Life is great. It's easier. Schools can, you know, do research. Everyone can touch it. But for a consumer, I'm, I'm honestly, if I would advise you to buy CBD from a licensed dispensary. Obviously, you can't always, but that's the only way I would advise. You just don't know what you're getting because it's not regulated quite yet. Yeah, and I just want to double down. Like, I absolutely agree with everything that Antonio just said. And I think that, um, you know, just because it's legal and you can find it at a gas station doesn't mean you should buy it at a gas station and I think we're you know seeing kind of some of the most like I've seen some of the most ridiculous um, CBD products since we've you know been seeing this farm farm bill and you know things like CBD infused pillows and CBD infused yoga pants and I'm just like what are we what are we doing here you know what I mean and I'm sure Antonio can probably attest to like how do you go about testing for quality control CBD yoga pants I mean what does that even look like yeah, I'll take it one step further. I mean, we've seen tampons and all kinds of suppositories. We see all kinds of things in the labs infused with CBD. Uh, but uh, I guess even beyond all of that, uh, about the products and efficacy, the one of the bigger concern is, oh my gosh, you just you just said it, it just made me blank my mind here. Uh, actually, I'll let you continue. I just I, I just had a, I had a funny story to tell you. I just completely forgot what it was, but I'll I'll bring it back if I can remember. Awesome. Um, so I've just been alerted that we are near the end of our time for the panel. So mm -hmm. I know that all of us could probably talk for significantly longer about all these very, very important topics, but we're going to jump to a couple of questions and see how many we have time to get through. So uh, this is an open question for everyone. Um, why hasn't the industry collectively done more with the GMP adoption from the pharmaceutical industry? So uh, Shweta, why don't you take a start at that one? So, I mean, we are still a fairly new industry. I, I, I mean, you know, if you look at the regulated market, it's only a few years old. Uh, these conversations are already happening. Um, GMP is a good manufacturing practices. So it, honestly, there's not much the labs can do with that. We recommend it. And I think a lot of labs tell people that you should have good manufacturing practices. Um, a lot of times, 
initially, it was hard to translate a lot of the different processes for uh, that were specific to cannabis in the guidelines of good manufacturing practices. But the truth is, most of it is good documentation, uh, standardized SOPs, and making sure that people follow procedures in a very reproducible manner. And so you are starting to see that emerge. And I think recently there was, before COVID-19 happened, there was actually a bill in the legislature that was going to recommend that be a requirement that be added to regulations that manufacturers have GMP requirements. And surprisingly, it came from the manufacturers themselves. So I think this is something that they recognize is a need. And, you know, I am all for it because the labs have always had, you know, standardization sort of um, yelled at us constantly, right? So ISO 17025 and GOP standards and any other standard you can throw at it, the labs are open to it. But I think the rest of the industry is catching up right now, realizing that this is good for everyone. So we'll, we'll get there. I wouldn't be surprised in the next few years you'll see that become a standard requirement as part of regulations in the legal cannabis industry across states. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Josh, what are your thoughts on uh, GMP requirements? Yeah, well, I think, I think, again, like going back to, you know, obviously reinventing the wheel. We're not reinventing the wheel here. And I think a lot of the analytical techniques that we're looking at and we're using come from pharma or food safety or environmental. So I think that, um, you know, obviously, um, you know, there is a disconnect between the cannabis industry and community and the pharmaceutical industry. And I think a lot of people um, really have fears about, you know, what it would look like if, you know, this was switched over um, federally. Would it go to pharma? Would it still stay in the industry? I really, you know, I feel that collaboratively, there's a lot to learn from each other. So we, that's really what, really one of the driving factors of why we started our conference was to really create a platform to bring together, you know, regulators and government officials, but also with the pharmaceutical and medical traditional science industry to collaborate and come together with this industry. Because obviously, you know, pharma has the capabilities to, you know, bring drugs to market, to do things like that. And, you know, this industry, the pioneers and cultivators of this industry have worked, you know, tirelessly over the past few decades to really cultivate this plant to what it is today. So I feel that there needs to be more of a collaborative kind of conversation back and forth. And we really try to foster that um, with our events and what we do, so. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Antonio, I've got one for you. Um, so right now, most states uh, require product labeling to include THC, CBD, and CBN, but we know that you guys have the capability to test for. Do you see a push for increasing the number of cannabinoids to be listed on a label requirement, or are there ways, because labels are so small and some of these product packages, you don't have a lot of room, are there ways uh, that you can see operators giving this information to consumers so that they know not just THC and CBD that's in their products, exactly. but other cannabinoids, terpenes, things like that? Yeah, um, that is a great question. So there are ways to do it. The packaging does make it difficult also can sometimes mess up branding. So there's a lot of frustration from manufacturers for some of these requirements, but it is necessary. I think uh, between doctors and researchers, we got to figure out what level cannabinoids are important to report. We got to figure out, you know, what minimum levels do we want to see? Uh, what minimum levels are we going to require? And then kind of at this point, we do have to set a target list though, because there's so many cannabinoids out there at some point, we do kind of have to say, okay, these 15 or even 40, however we want to, you have to be able to uh, label or be aware of them at this level. And that's kind of, to I think her point, everyone's talking about single molecule this, single molecule that, but between terpenes and all these cannabinoids, there are so many things that matter. And um, there are ways to get it out. I mean, we do QR codes all the time. So you take your phone, you know, you can scan up on results and you see the whole COA. And if you understand that, um, it's, you know, it's very useful, but for the average consumer, it means nothing. So it goes back to education, it goes back to federal support, and it goes back to standardization. Because even with CBD, um, what, what, what I was going to say earlier is that there should be no smokable hemp. I mean, there should, it shouldn't be a thing. Anything you smoke should be uh, cannabis-based and tested and whatnot, because uh, with hemp, things aren't being controlled, and you don't know anything about terpene levels and all these other things. And you can smoke high THC A flower, the acid decarboxylated to delta-9, you get high as a kite, and you can fill a drug test and lose your job. There's so many things that people don't realize when this new industry, gas station, I say all the time, smoking with hemp in a gas station is dope. You're smoking dope. It's marijuana. I mean, it's, it's got THC all in it. Forget about Delta 9 not being there quite yet, but I guarantee you when you put a lighter to it, you're going to get some of that. And that's why you feel so good, too. Um, 
but yeah, so it is pretty difficult to get all that stuff on the label, but there are ways to get that information and you can demand it from your producer. Just demand the information. If the customer requests it, it'll happen. I, I, I promise you. Thanks, Antonio. Um, we may have time for one more question or I might be told that we're all done. Okay, so that was it for this panel. Uh, thank you, Josh, Antonia, and Shwitha for giving uh, all of the attendees some very valuable information. And we will try to any answer any follow-up questions that we didn't get to um, remotely when we can. Thank you.